Okay. See everybody can see uh, me. We're all traveling in um, very new territory uh, for some of us and excited. So I am Michael Diamond, uh, Academic Director of Integrated Marketing Educations, I'm at the School of Professional Studies. Uh, I want to welcome all of you here to the webinar and certainly to express our sincere hope uh, in your families, our students, faculty, staff and uh, corporate colleagues are all uh, and, and stay safe and, and well. Um, the School of Professional Studies, um, as some of you know, and not only probably the premier place to receive an applied professional education, but it's also a place which was founded on this notion of opportunity for all. Uh, I th think it's very fitting that we were able to make this event uh, an online uh, event and, uh, you know, therefore uh, allow more people to join. And so I'm excited about the opportunity to share uh, work of, of, of Karen Nelson with you. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome her to our community. Um, we would have loved to welcome her in person and uh, maybe uh, in better times, as they say, we'll have to see her in New York on campus. But um, Karen kindly and very generously agreed to keep the allotted time and, and join this webinar. And I say that mindful that it is at 2 a.m. in the morning for Karen, she's speaking. So she looks like she's in the middle of Times Square which would mean she's probably the today, but she's actually uh, in, uh, in, in, in Adelaide, I believe, so, so in Australia. So we thank her very, very much for that. Um, and uh, one thing I will say is as we go through uh, the, the um, as we go to the session today, there are really two ways if you wish to interact and ask questions. I, for the purposes of managing the, the web, all uh, speakers except the panelists are muted so I apologize for that if you get a question in verbally but you still can ask questions you can do it via the chat uh, and certainly if you have any you know so logistical questions uh, my colleague Julia Potapoff is, is, is monitoring the chat you can do it through uh, the Q&A and I believe all of you should see at the bottom if not chat then definitely Q&A yes uh, Q&A, uh, if you look at the bottom of the screen in the black box, uh, if you click on there, you're able to ask, and I will monitor those questions and I'll fill them to Karen when we take a couple of breaks. Uh, so uh, that's the way I'd like to handle it. Hopefully uh, that works well for everybody. Uh, Karen um, is the founder and CEO of the consulting firm Amplified Intelligence. But she's also a distinguished professor of media in innovation at Adelaide University. And she was herself a former marketing executive and a researcher in the corporate world. Um, her most recent book, uh, The Entire Attention Economy, has been published with great acclaim uh, around the world. And, and it's an important, I, and I think you'll find a, a timely entry into the discussion how media works. And what we need to do as advertisers, marketers, communicators, et cetera, to leverage and understand this. So without any further ado, I'm gonna pass the screen over to Karen and um, allow her uh, to share her presentation. We'll take a short break, perhaps minutes in, we'll do some Q&A and then the rest of the presentation. And please feel free to ask questions. wherever you want run super happy for to be part of this i feel like we're we're all walking through history together at the moment i'm going to share my desktop just bear with me um okay people <clears throat> Okay, so I'm hoping, Michael, that you can see my deck um, and that I'm not in Times Square anymore. If that's not the case, just message me. Um, okay, so today was uh, a little bit about um, what the, the, the findings are in the research book, um, as Michael mentioned. 
But I think it's important that I give you a little bit of background um, on my journey. Um, you know, it's exciting. I love being a part of student uh, groups to sort of see, you know, where you or young people going through um, and, and where you're headed in your careers. So I feel like I might just give you a little bit of context um, to warm us all up. Um, I'm going to take you through um, a little bit about my uh, working history, but I also want to talk to you about some of the findings from when I was still at the university um, and my research agenda and, and kind of talking a little bit about, let me just check this uh, message. Are we all good, Michael? Oh, good. Ignore the messages. Sure. <laughs> I will ignore them. Um, okay. So without further ado. Okay. So, so before I do, I, I, I am very fortunate. So to Michael's point, I do, you know, I do have a commercial business. Um, there's 10 of us. Uh, we're not a, a massive business, but we have launched technology in 10 countries, uh, sorry, six countries. Um, and these are some of the uh, brands that have been fortunate for me to, to work with. Um, and some of them are fairly large players. So um, thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, and they, they all do different things. Some of them are sponsoring attention uh, research. Some of them have been looking more broadly at marketing um, and strategy and media strategy more broadly. Um, but I'm very, very fortunate to work with some of the biggest businesses in the world. Okay, that's my emoji. <laughs> um, so let me just take you through my journey. Um, so in my 20s, when I was your age, because I think you're doing masters if I'm, if I'm right. When I was doing my masters, I was actually working full time for News Corp. So, you know, every Australian works for News Corp. <laughs> that's kind of in our blood. Um, I was the youngest um, manager of advertising sales in their history um, and ran some teams across multiple publishers. Um, so that was an amazing entry point for me. And it's funny because I always wanted to be in media. So when I was even younger than my 20s, I remember, you know, um, you know, going through the hospitality and retail like everyone and sort of really striving to want to work in the media game. Um, and I got there and worked there for quite a number of years. Then I made a decision. I wanted to move away from uh, media side and I wanted to get experience um, in marketing from a brand side. So I was fortunate enough to pick up an analyst role uh, with Diageo. In those days it was called United Distillers, but um, I was an analyst, but I was also premium brand manager. So across my time there, I spread my, my skill base. So I started actually um, as analyst, which was um, kind of research based, but then moved on to brand manager. So I was responsible for the Johnny Walker premium brands, um, a lot of the, the single malt Scotch whiskies, which you can only really get at, you know, airports and things like that. And they're expensive. Um, you know, you may have heard of Stella Chinea, um, all of those types of brands were in my portfolio as well. Did that for a few years. Um, then I actually um, wanted to step up and have uh, start to manage big teams. So I went to the Australian Tourism Commission and I was responsible for four groups. Um, so it's quite a big, uh, it was 60 people I sort of jumped into head first. Um, and that was everything from research to regional marketing to development. So it was looking at product development. Um, I can't remember the fourth one now, it was so long ago. Um, so I feel like for me, my career has started in the media space, but then I tried to get broader marketing experience. Then what happened is I, um, I actually had kids. So at 30, I had my first child. And, um, you know, when you are with babies, it's hard to go back to executive roles. So I made a decision to see if I could do a PhD which, you know, study is my life. So it was a fantastic opportunity um, to take a few years to myself while I had the boys and um, did a PhD. Um, but 
I happen to love research, so I jumped straight into it. I um, really uh, excelled quite quickly through the system, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about today, a bit about the research and the fun bits. Um, so I was a lecturer with Ehrenberg Bass Institute, which you may have heard of, which is quite famous in its space for applied research. Um, and my particular research was uh, specifically around audience segmentation. So I jumped straight back into media, which is my first love, um, and won a federal government to do that, funded federal government grant to do that. So love that. Um, got to professor pretty quickly, um, and you'll soon see why, because of the research that I picked. Then made a decision about three and a half years ago to step back from work from that. So um, I won't tell you how many years that was because then you can work out my age, um, but made a call. But by that time, I'd been around um, the in industry long enough to know that um, attention was becoming quite a measure of interest and more importantly, technology. So for me, traditional market research is um, is quite an old field, um, but I've, well, I wanted to innovate and to start to investigate how technology can scale um, research and bring research questions into passive collection um, and, and, a, and a lot more forward thinking. So, so that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll get into it. So I wanted to just kind of talk to you about what, why I'm here. And so from my very first, and these are the sorts of things that you guys should be thinking about now, because you know some of you will continue. So through my master's research, um, I sort of knew that if I was to continue in any further research, I wanted to sort of stick to the media space. Um, <clears throat> so as I was doing my, um, as I was doing my uh, PhD, um, my agenda became quite clear um, that, uh, and, and bearing in mind I'm older than you, so, and a lot older, so I, um, when I sort of started my PhD and my postdoc, um, it was when Facebook was five years in, um, and it was before they were even a publicly traded company. So it was still fairly early, everyone was really excited and also very confused about what was happening in the media space. Um, so when, when, you know, a lot of the online platforms, you know, YouTube was really early, um, but particularly Facebook, there was a lot of, you know, um, I'll say BS in, in the space. There were a lot of big claims about, you know, um, what this platform might do for your marketing. And, and really early on, I started to realize, you know, this online space, which was new, is going to take us in a whole new direction. And, you know, what are the things that are going on? There was no real accountability um, in, in traditional media like television and, and newspapers. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, um, I guess, government um, rules around what can happen and what can't happen. But in the, in the new world of digital, there was re relatively little regulation. So it was quite an interesting agenda for me to pick. So my point to you is if you do want to go on and do some more work or you do want to, um, even if it's not academically, but even if it's in your own organizations, pick work that will get, you know, um, get you kind of spotlighted pretty quickly. And this is the sort of area that, that I chose. So, so let me take you through a couple of the things that I did. So right back in 2012, um, really early days, I said, before Facebook were even a massive thing, um, it was uh, not even IPO'd. Um, I kind of knew there was a problem with the nature of the fan base. So again, whether you remember this or not, it was a while ago now, um, but they were claiming these big things like, um, you know, if, if you have followers, you know, you get all this extra loyalty and all this extra engagement. Um, and at the time, having studied there in Big Bass, um, I knew that the concept of loyalty was um, probably a myth. Um, and the way to grow a brand was much more about uh, attracting light buyers than getting people to, to be more loyal. So there are statistical regularities behind brand growth. Um, so I commissioned um, um, 
a, a team of researchers and, and in those days they actually had this these metrics um, sitting on the front of the the fan pages so there was this thing called PTAT which actually kind of clicked along and it would show you on a daily basis or on a, on a minute by minute basis this little kind of ticker and it was a combination of how many people liked you and how many people you know were sharing your content etc so we disentangled long story short we disentangled the algorithm to try and understand um you know once someone liked your brand how often did they actually go back to the fan page and this this major piece of work came out which was in any given week less than one percent of the fan base bothered to go back to the brand so that was, I released that information, I presented that information in New York, literally at the time that Facebook were going to IPO. So it caused huge, huge publicity. In fact, we were noted in the trade press um, as having an impact on their less than stellar IPO. So, so my name became kind of fairly common around, you know, they're challenging the engagement model. Um, so, so it was a pretty freaky time for me to be a postdoc and then be kind of literally hunted down by every newspaper <laughs> or news publisher in the world trying to understand what this research was about. So, so Facebook were not very happy with me at the time, um, but it was one of those pieces of research that literally catapulted um, my name, I, I guess, into, into the world. Um, so the next big piece of work that I wanted to challenge, albeit this is probably not an appropriate slide for today, um, but um, it's also kind of a very relevant slide. Um, so back in 2013 and 14, this concept of viral marketing became a thing and everyone sort of said, you know, if you share it, then thousands or millions of people will see. So it's concept of, of viral marketing. But I often say to this day that the word viral is probably one of the most grossly misused words in marketing lingo today. Again, quite difficult to talk about given the distance that we have between us. But the reality is that the way that content diffuses is not like a normal pandemic. At the moment, if one person costs, lots of people get it. Whereas the way that content diffuses is the other way. So you have to have a lot of people that are infected for a few people to share it. So we proved that out um, across multiple studies and multiple years and um, ended up putting it into a book actually. But again, picking these big high profile concepts to sort of disprove um, it made me kind of fairly famous in the, in the space. So there was a huge amount of work around that. I was able to present at Khan. Um, we also looked at emotions that helped um, the, the view to share ratio. Um, so that I ended up writing a book with Oxford University um, and I started the reach is not free movement. So what that means is you can't just expect. So there was this whole concept of earned and paid media in those days. Um, it's not so much the case now, but I started this, this movement that reach is not free. And in fact, you have to seed content online for you to get any sort of incremental or uh, free reach. Um, so that was another piece of work that I was really proud of. Fast forward a couple more years. Um, by this time, I started to look at um, work around... Um, the viewability standard let me explain that to you so so up until now the internet was fairly unregulated um, whereas as i said so newspapers in particular television in particular were very very government regulated so so the rules around how an impression was formed so how how an advertiser pays for that and how um or, or the rules around what content you can put on were really really rigid because it had been around for years and years and years but with the advent of the internet it was all very new so um, around 2014 um, a group of um, industry bodies started to get together and go hang on a sec we're all being ripped off um, you know there's ad fraud and there's there's problems with ad loading and you know we're all getting ripped off we should have some sort of viewability standard what what is considered an impression 
so that we we are charged based on that so that we pay money for a validated impression. So the MRC, which is actually an American organization called the Media Rating Council, um, which are connected to the Senate actually, they're the ones that are legally responsible for mandating what um, the currency looks like. So around 2016, I think it was, um, sorry, 2014, 15, um, the MRC, um, together with global bodies, as well as advertisers, as well as platforms, came together and made this decision that you, you are charged an impression if it's 50% pixels on screen and two continuous seconds of time. Let me explain that. So an ad, if you think about when you're scrolling online, um, ads come and go through the, the feed. So officially an impression if it's 50%, if the ad is 50% on screen and it's on your screen for two continuous seconds, someone will be charged full total odds for that. So that's what the viewability standard is. So I was thinking at the time, how is that fair? How is it that, you know, on television, it's 100% pixels and however many minutes, however many seconds on time, how is it that fair to advertisers that at 50% on screen, we are, that you pay 100%, um, you know, cost. So I started to look into that. Um, and so some of the research that came out of that again became famous. Um, so this work, um, which was launched in 2017 in Australia, shows that actually once, so there is, there is a, the minimum standard does render an impact. So we said to the MRC and we worked with them, that that's good news, that at the end of the day, if an ad is in 50% view, there is an impact of the ad, which is fantastic, but look what happens after the fact. So there's a material uplift in sales beyond 50% pixels in two seconds. So I, I'm an advocate for the advertiser and I say, how is that fair to an advertiser who pays 100% premium, but yet their ad is on screen for 50% of the time. So that work, as you can imagine, was not very favorable again to the platforms because because think about the way the platforms work um, if you if we if we sort of talk about facebook they, they've improved their viewability standard now but at the time you know it's hard for them to achieve 100 percent pixels so anything above 50 percent would impact their commercial models so so there was a lot of pressure but obviously very contentious point so it it got a lot of publicity. So I went to market with this statement, which is visibility is king, and it's a very large contributor to attention and sales. I'll get to attention in a minute, because by this time we'd started to record um, passive attention. So for me, again, made huge, huge waves in the marketplace. Um, I got to press everywhere. Um, the MRC was challenged around, is this okay that advertisers are being shortchanged? Um, and sure enough, um, what happened was that the MRC started proposing 100% viewable cross media standards. So, so there is movement towards, so people, research makes a difference. So do, do good research, get it out there, and um, you know, it will have an impact, which is what you, you want your work to be. Okay, so fast forward uh, to today. I am going to talk to you a little bit about what I'm passionate about at the moment and how we collect the data we collect. Um, so the, the latest thing on, on um, my uh, agenda is the way that advertising is being traded or the way media impressions are being traded. Um, so again, you, you guys are all not very old, um, but if, you do understand at all how measure, how media is bought. Essentially, media is bought on a cost per thousand basis, and it's typically traded on um, an opportunity to see relative to demographics. So if you're at home and um, you might be watching television, you would be considered an opportunity to see if your television's on, for example. And like we just said, in the digital space, an impression is with if the pixels is 50% in view, but no one really understands whether there's a human involved because there's ad fraud um, and there's measurement issues. And each of the, each of the platforms uh, mark their own homework. So how it works is the big measurement companies collect data from the platforms, 
um, and they have to take that as gospel. Um, so, so without going into too much detail, the experts are saying that the way media is traded is absolutely flawed for a number of reasons, um, and it's predicted to change quite drastically. So for me, what I'm good at is I'm good at picking future uh, arguments. And this is something that I've been sort of seeing for a while. Um, but the concept of attention, now this is human attention. So this is not clicks. This is not proxy measures. They call them vanity measures. This is about human attention. So are you even in front of your phone? Are you looking at the ad? Are you in front of the television? Um, not are you potentially in front of the television? Um, so attention is poised to become um, a measure of quality impressions. And it's something that I picked a while ago. So I'm gonna just quickly take you through the technology that we've built um, over the last three and a half years so that you understand what we do and the depth of what we do. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about the book and what findings we have um, so that you understand where we're at. Hopefully you're all still there and I'm not boring anyone. Um, it's hard not to see you. I wish I was in front of you. So let's just um, say um, our technology is largely software. So my goal was to be able to collect attention at scale. So what we built in essence is, and we'll, we'll dial it down to Instagram. So what we've built is we've built a system that um, you would, if you were a panel member, firstly, I get your approval. So you, you've logged in as a panel member and we pay you for this and you've approved. In fact, it's double opt-in. So just in case you're concerned. Um, so we have an app system and, and a software architecture system, but you download our app. You say, yes, I'm happy to participate. And yes, I'll take your money. Thanks. You log in with the login ID that we give you. You again are happy that we intercept your camera. Um, so what happens is we um, send you to Instagram. We actually have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We've done lots and lots of TV platforms because there's catch up on your phone. And we're working towards lots of um, other platforms, including publishers, more broadly web publishers. So we send you to Instagram. What we've done is we've um, actually intercepted your front facing camera. Again, you can see we asked permission. So we're filming you watching Instagram, basically. You go onto Instagram, you log in as yourself. We are not collecting your personal information. We do not collect that footage at that point. And we can then intercept ad loads. So see the Calvin Klein ad on the screen? We have put that in your feed. Normally it might be something for Kentucky Fried Chicken or KFC or whatever, but we've put that in your feed so that we um, are basically intercepting ad loads so we know what you're watching. But we also put JavaScript behind those ads so we can tell how fast you're scrolling, um, whether you've got the sound on or off, whether you um, have kept it there for a while. So maybe it's there for a minute, maybe it's there for one second. In other platforms such as YouTube, we can tell whether you've orientated your phone so that you've put it in full screen. Um, we can do all of those sorts of things. And bearing in mind, we're taking facial footage at that point. We also then can send you to a virtual store at the end, which allows me to see if that, so this is a German version, if you haven't already guessed, if anyone's German, the Germans, we, we, we just literally shut off three German speaking countries last week. So I put this in the example. So you go to a store and you pick from a shelf of depending on what brands they are, then all that data is sent back to our stack. And essentially what I have is whether you've seen an ad, or whether you've been exposed to an ad, whether you've interacted with it at all, what you've chosen, the facial footage is then sent back to our, these are our machine learning models. And what we do is we can tell whether you're not looking at the screen at all. So if you're not looking at your phone whatsoever, whether you're looking at the phone and not at the ad, so you might be reading your feed or whether you're looking at the ad. So that facial footage is transposed back through a mathematical model that allows us to tell where you're looking on, on the page. So again, bearing in mind, we have YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Bvod, 
and we can intercept ad load across all of those platforms so that we can tell what metrics of the platform have an impact on your attention so that score is attention so it's pretty it's pretty deep we've been doing it for a few years now and at the moment we're up to six countries 15 platforms 120,000 test ad views so we're pretty proud of it so this is what we're going to talk about today so all of the work from the last three and a half years i'm going to literally share i literally was in london i'm in self-isolation at the moment because i was literally in london last week presenting my book I was supposed to be with you, but unfortunately Trump locked me out. Um, <clears throat> so um, what's happened from the back end of this work is again, always pick things that you will uh, be in the press for. So we've also um, started, I'm a co-chair of a global attention council. So we're really passionate about the work around um, improving or uh, being a part of the conversation with impression reform. So some of the brands, I can't, literally tell you the ones that are about to be announced because I noticed this is being recorded but some of the famous brands at the moment are Mars, Microsoft, Diageo, Denso and Horizon um, and there are also there's uh, four or five of us that are um, uh, vendors so people who are researchers that are involved so um, yeah it's pretty exciting to be a part of that so I just want to show you a quick video so our technology was um, highlighted at CES this year luckily fortunately it wasn't cancelled South by Southwest was cancelled which unfortunately I was going to be a keynote but I didn't get to go to but CES this is a quick video of what we do Karen, it, it's Michael here. Uh, we we didn't catch audio, I think, for most of us on that. Oh so, no! Okay. Um, I'm, let me let me technical intervention. If you share your screen, um, and when you share your screen, there should be a bottom, a listen to the bottom left that will say play through computer audio. Just if you oh. want to try that one more time, and if it works great, if not, we'll just keep going with the presentation. Yeah, I feel like Michael. Um, it's also we're at um, thirty minutes. Uh, so, did you want anyone to sure. ask any questions? Uh, I'm okay, happy so where do, do you, that, yeah. where do I where do I do the share? Let me just try and go um, back. In the green arrow, when you hit share, see bottom, you should have a little bar that says use computer audio. If not, we'll proceed. So, guys, any questions? Um, I'll take the video back uh, from from Karen, and. Um, and uh, I will um, I, I will um, 
pick position. One of the things uh, it's kind of a question that I've heard is, you know, we're interested, to, I guess, why you think the advertisers and the media players have been a bit uh, uh, resistant to some of your ideas. You know, we, we would expect them typically to really want to get ahead of, uh, of, of the curve. So what, what do you think some of the resistance is? So advertisers are not resistant. It's media owners that are resistant. <laughs> advertisers love it. Advertisers love it because it brings, you know, fairness to uh, and a voice to, to their trading. So the only people I get drama from are the media owners and with respect, it's because it can impact their commercial opportunities. Um, so, you know, these, these media owners are going to market with, you know, major claims of, um, you know, if you advertise with us, this will happen. And most of my research shows that that's not the case. Um, so it, it, it's challenging their commercial model. You know, as a researcher, the, the good news is that um, many of them have actually improved their functionality as a result of the work we've done. So I'm really, really happy with that. But to be clear, advertisers love it because they feel like someone's on their team and that's my job. Right. Perfect. We had some questions too about the uh, technology itself. And I know it's just, how do you get people to, you know, you've had a large number of people engaged, but uh, you know, what, what's, what's the pitch? How do you participate? I, I presume uh, the questioner meant people, you know, the people who you're then going to be watching. I pay them a lot of money. So would you do it for 50 bucks for 10 minutes? Um, so I pay them a fair bit of money to do it. Um, we are GDPR compliant um, and we have um, it uh, translated into multiple languages. So we're, I am super, super fussy about ethics. So none of that facial footage we see, it goes directly through a, um, an automated model. So not even my staff see it, it goes through our servers and it gets translated to score. Um, so we're super fussy. And when we recruit, we recruit through global panels that handle this sort of stuff and we pay you money. Um, and we are very grateful for anyone who's interested in being part of the research. Um, and, 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 and at a moment's notice, if they don't wanna be part of it, we delete their data. Um, so, you know, research like this is not cheap. Um, and we are working towards a scalable model at the moment. Um, but, um, you know, we, over the years, um, we've improved the seamlessness of it. So we just, yeah, we, we pay people who, who are interested in being part of it and who we're grateful to 50 bucks or something like that. Perfect. We're, we're, a couple of questions a bit about the, uh, you know, benchmarking essentially. And then, and then a couple of questions about, sort of, you know, sort of ecosystem change, you might be able to, the question came in about, are you creating any kind of benchmarks for attention in different media? So is there a way to think about, you know, uh, attention across media? Because um, it would seem that it would be quite helpful for advertisers then to use it to evaluate different creatives across different media. Mate, that is the best question. Firstly, because we haven't done the second part of the presentation, um, that is a great question, but you will see essentially from the second part, what we've done, but that's 100% why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so the plan is about generalizable baselines. Um, so where the data is being used now, so apart from the, the book stuff, which is, you know, do this, this and this, and that will help get more attention. Um, the big part of my business, quite frankly, a great question is that people are using that data to inform their buying tools. Um, so that these baselines can then be used against their current um, uh, impression systems. So that's exactly where my business is headed. My business, so, so our data is using, it is creating norms um, and it, it's, it's what they call a supplementary layer to um, existing impression systems. So, so that's, so we don't, I don't see, in my lifetime, you know, I'm getting older. I don't see before I retire that attention will be the primary currency because you can't change a currency overnight. So it'll be a 20 year exercise before systems are changed, maybe not 20, maybe even 10. Um, but, but the data we're using is, is a supplementary layer to that. So that's an excellent question. 
So we'll come, great, so we'll come back to that. And uh, a shout out to one of our profs, Matthew Sawyer, for that question. So oh, all goody. credit to him. Um, yeah, I had a question cool. here uh, also, and, and then for your chance to get back to your presentation, really a bit about uh, the opportunities there for advertisers to create platforms. This is a very broad ecosystem question, you know, and, and, and in somehow boycott or, 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 or get around the existing digital media platform. So any thoughts about whether your work specifically uh, helps take advertisers? Or generally, if you see that movement in the end? I don't see that movement. I feel like that was um, something that sort of happened a few years ago, but most have moved away. Infrastructure to maintain that is crazy. Um, so I don't see a lot of advertisers having their own media channels quite as much anymore. There are still some brands that do, um, but at the end of the day, they still have to integrate with current platforms. And that will only get more... Um, more important as the likes of Amazon become a media channel unto itself. So I did see that trend. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, it's not as big as it was a few years ago. And, you know, you think about the brands we work with and there's very few that I know that would even take that, that task because, you know, creating content and, and it is huge, huge costs and revenue costs. So. Okay, I think we'll let you get back to your main presentation. And the, with respect to the video, we will. I just um, did what you said. I just a bit just share the other one. I mean, it's just a little bit about what I already said anyway. But I've done what you've said, so hopefully the next video you'll be able to hear. Perfect. And we'll we'll the first video we'll give away as a door prize. So we're we're all good. Uh, we'll share that with participants after the call. Okay, so uh, okay. again, I encourage you, you. Some of you look quite active. Use chat. Use q and a if you have any for karen i am building uh, building them and and we'll have a chance to to reconvene and karen uh, give her a chance to finish up her presentation thanks very much so michael if you've got any info if you want to ask me anything in between don't don't hesitate to off mute yourself and ask me because you know I, i'm good with interaction but i'm going to continue yes <laughs> Good. Those okay, who so know me, Aaron, those who know me know me well, and they know I never pull back from asking a question, but uh, <laughs> I'm testing out a new form, so all yours. Okay, cool. All right, so let's get straight to some of the findings which come directly from that technology and directly from the history. Um, so I've set it out in a series of um, main remember this is, if you like. So throughout the book, hopefully, um, the uni will get your bunch. Um, it kind of picks up the biggest um, learnings um, and separates them into these remember this is. So what I'm gonna start with is, okay. Um, so in the age of distraction, um, attention is not the focused version that marketers realize. So I feel like this is a really important point. So what we can see in the data um, is that even even passive attention plays a role. So let me let me start by saying, you know, we're all so mentally overloaded. Um, we filter out most things, let some things in. So if anyone does speed reading, how you build speed, how you do speed reading is is via context. So so it means that we're living in this perpetual state. I call it perpetual state of zombie, but it's technically perpetual state of subconsciousness. Um, and so what happens in our world is we we kind of largely operate in our own bubble and that occasionally we let stuff in and what we do is we take decision shortcuts to cope so you know if you're going to buy something let's just for argument's sake say i don't know a new pair of jeans there's only so much research you'll do and then you go right that's enough i'm going to buy that one so so you don't take everything in there. there's just too much information out there and this concept is called satisficing where basically you're trying to avoid overwhelm and you make decisions based on that's good enough. Um, and the more busy we get, the more um, the more that happens. And that, that's the same in the case of advertising. So advertisers need to understand that we don't sit there and pay undivided, sustained attention to ads, right? That's not realistic. At the end of the day, advertising is the least of our interests, particularly right now. Um, so with it not being a priority, we switch in and out of focus. So this is a, a, a data sample of a typical, I think there's four or five views on there. So most um, humans will 
switch in and out of focus. So you'll see that our scores go from zero to 50 to 100, zero to 50 to 100. So we see rather than you sit there and you watch an ad from zero to 30 seconds, which is unheard of, you literally go, oh, what's that? Look out, look out, look, get distracted, move back in, get distracted, move back in, sit there for a couple of seconds. So that's the reality of focus. So, so we are not getting people's engagement and we're not taking them along this long branded journey for 30 seconds or even 10 seconds, to be honest. It's a constant switch in and out every couple of seconds. And when advertisers start to understand that, they can understand that there are things they can do to improve those moments when we actually do watch. Um, but that is the reality of our world. And unless you think we're going to get less busy, that is the reality of our world. So these things called guidance triggers. So guidance triggers come from the psychology literature, which talk about things that stimulate attention. And it can do things, uh, it, it, there's two ways. So top down triggers are things like personal relevance. Um, so the majority of my book is based on the second one, which is bottom up triggers. So things that an advertiser can do to do to drive automatic and unintended attention. Um, but top down relevance is, is important too. So obviously, if you are particularly looking for those pairs of jeans, you're going to look at ads for pairs of jeans more intently. And that's, that's, a, that's a given. But that happens very infrequently. And that's hard to target at scale. So bottom up triggers are things like uh, things, things that snap you into attention without you even having um, really noted it. So when, when a siren goes, probably different in New York because you hear a lot of sirens, but if there's a siren going here, we know something's wrong and I'll stop and watch. Um, so those, or if, if someone's talking or you heard your name called, you'll probably um, stop and watch. So that's, that's bottom up triggers. So, so important to remember as advertisers that, that, attention is not sustained and, and um, high level of engagement as you hoped. Um, so, so another big important thing, we just talked about how we collect for visibility and we, we talked about how um, my work with the MRC um, guidelines really, really made a splash. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about that now. So the second, remember this is if you can't see the ad, guidance triggers won't help. Um, and I often you know, talk about this as being uh, an obvious moment. I, I, I'm sometimes embarrassed about this finding because, you know, if an ad's not there, you can't see it, no matter how, you know, relevant or no matter how, you know, um, uh, unexpected it might be, it's not going to, it's not going to help. So, so uh, the book talks a lot about the concept of pixels and coverage. Um, so if you think about pixels, um, so this is the MRC standard. Pixels is the proportion of the ad that is on the screen, right? Whereas coverage is the proportion of the screen that the ad covers. So they're slightly two different um, concepts. The coverage one is about spatial clutter because it kind of, if it's 100% coverage, there's no other ads around it. So there's no distraction, which is why we see what we see in a lot of the online platforms is why attention's lower. I'll get to that. But what we did find um, in our work is that pixels matter a lot to attention and brand choice. So anything below 100% pixels diminishes the opportunity for advertisers. And we also see that screen coverage plays a role too. Now, bearing in mind, what I didn't tell you is, and the video did explain, is we do mobile, but we also do television. And we've also done tablets and we've also done PCs. So, so we have, we're very fair to the different platforms that we we consider and we can see these relationships generalize across multiple media and multiple countries, which is where we're starting to get these baselines, which is why it was such a good question. So it's no surprise that attention varies considerably across platforms because we know that pixels and, and, and coverage play a role. Obviously, ad visibility differs so significantly by platform. So, um, you know, if you have a look at Facebook compared to YouTube, Facebook's viewability or visibility is significantly lower than YouTube and YouTube's is lower than television. Again, all of, in fairness to all of these platforms, what we've seen in the last 18 months is that they've improved their viewability averages, um, but it's certainly not 100% pixels, 100% coverage all the time, which if you see to the right, you can see that on most, in most cases is, is how you would watch television on a mobile or television on a major screen or cinema for that matter. You know, cinema's full screen. Um, so ad visibility makes a big difference. 
And, and if nothing more, then, you know, it can mean the difference between seeing the brand or not. So, you know, if you've got, a, um, in on the case on the left, a 70 cent pixels ad, but the brand happens to be in the bottom right corner, then you're not going to see what the brand is for. So we, I'll talk about this in a minute, um, but, but if you don't see the brand, it's quite likely that you'll misattribute that ad to the larger competitor. Um, so if anyone knows anything about double jeopardy, which means that bigger brands um, have more uh, have have more customers and they buy more often, it relates to mental availability as well. So bigger brands, you think of them more, and more people think of them. So so that's a really important issue with viewability because if your brand's not present for any moment in time, then um, you know it's quite possible that if you were Pepsi, you'd be attributed to Coke. Um, so time on screen helps too, um, but we see that less so, um, and we see this with diminishing returns. What that means is that um, you don't have to have, it, it doesn't get, it's not exponential across the curve. So, so it's a point where enough's enough seconds, um, and that varies depending on which platform. So, so the, 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 the bigger screen platforms, there's a, there's a, a sweet spot of more seconds, whereas the platforms like Facebook, the sweet spot, you know, the most attention you're going to pay if you're lucky is four to six seconds if you're lucky. Um, so we do see that the longer it is on screen, the better, but there's a point at which it doesn't improve your return. So, so time is important, but not as much as being seen. So going back to these triggers, um, this is um, some work that another professor in Australia, he's actually a Harvard um, med um, graduate, but he's now in Australia. Um, he talks about the concept of unexpectedness um, being a bottom-up trigger. Let me explain. He talks about if you want to grab someone's um, attention, you must, you must break their prediction. Like, so we go through life in this constant state of zombie, knowing what to expect. We know when you get to a stoplight, what's going to happen. You know, generally, you know, when you're driving, you're almost in autopilot. We, we live in this world of autopilot. So, so Jared um, talks about, and he's got a separate book. He talks about if you want someone to pay attention, you have to break their prediction because they go, my God, I wasn't expecting that. And, and he talks about this concept of when a prediction fails, that's when a brain is primed to take in new information. Now, interestingly, his work is related to education. So his is not in advertising, but he looks at um, how kids learn. Um, and so a lot of what he talks about can be, can be related to our world, um, but obviously the education sector is, is a much more important piece of work. Um, so this piece of work um, that an agency out of the US did, I feel is really a funny example. And you know, if I could hear you laughing, I would love that. But I often say this on stage and go, so, so, so the Colonel Sanders on the right broke my prediction and I'm kind of happy he did. Whereas, you know, the big old fat Colonel Sanders is less eye appealing to me. So, so there are some advertisers that are kind of looking at um, unexpectedness and going, look, we're going to have some fun with that. So you should follow that campaign. So um, modern Colonel Sanders, they do some crazy things, uh, but this is obviously my favorite. <laughs> um, so this is Jared's book. I'm sure that you're going to get all these slides to, and if it's being recorded, you can take a note of that. Um, but if nothing more people to help you through your education, um, so it's about brain science. So he's a, an, an actual neuroscience. So he's not a neuromarketer. So neuromarketer are people that think they're scientists in the space, um, but a neuroscientist is someone that actually understands cognitive functioning. So, so do grab his book if you can. But from my world, um, some things that we see as uh, triggers, as unexpectedness, is a good old fashioned emotions. Um, so some of my earlier work, um, uh, which to this day gets um, quoted, um, we looked at emotions relative to sharing. So what we know about emotions is it's, it's long noted as um, a behavioral outcome. So, so people share more on high emotions, she, people um, you know, email more, um, memes, 
memory, that sort of stuff. Um, so, so just to explain what I do is I split it into a construct of positive and negative emotions, pretty obvious, but then we split it into pairs. So within positive, there's high and low arousal, within negative, there's high and low arousal. And what that is, that's not me doing that, that comes from literature, I just built the construct. Um, so high arousal emotions are things that make, you know, physiological response. So hilarity makes you actually snort and laugh. Um, inspiration you might just you know at the moment we need some of that to be honest and you know you how how the stories from spain and and from italy where they're locked down and they're singing you know that gives you goosebumps makes you cry um so that's kind of a high arousal physiological emotion and what we see is that we can also see that is linked to attention so don't worry about the graphs i just let let me just talk through it but but what we see is that um, it drives a higher sales measure. Um, I'll talk about STAS um, a little bit, but basically STAS is, is an index. So we, so how we collect sales is we take brand choice and we also baseline it with um, what we would expect if someone wasn't viewing an ad and it's an index. So anything over 100 means an ad is successful. The difference between 128 and 167 is that um, high arousal drives more sales, for example, or short term advertising strength than low arousal. So we can see that emotional ads drive attention in terms of scores, but it also drives familiarity. So Jared's right. The prevalence piece at the bottom describes the situation that most ads are pretty crap um, and they're not very emotionally driven. And that's hard. That's hard to do to just have the best creative all the time. But that is a real issue from a creative perspective. So what I will say is, uh, oops, sorry, beg your pardon, is that it's not enough just to put um, a baby on or, or a hot guy or a cute dog or um, because sometimes animals are boring. So what we found in the previous work that I did is that just because you've got a dog on the screen doesn't mean see, people are going to pay attention to it. It's what the device does. So if the dog was to do something crazy or hilarious or upsetting, it's not that he's just sitting there. So, so, so do understand that talent is less of a driver. It's more how emotive that talent is. So we also see that sound is a promising trigger. So um, for example, um, we, and, and so, so what you need to understand about me as a researcher is I believe in generalization. So if I was to find, so we have found that, that sound plays a role in intention, but we can only see it in one study. Now, the reason why we've only seen it in one study at the moment is because in most cases online, sound is default to zero, right? So as a researcher, and maybe take this on board, um, when you see results that are one off, you have to take caution. It's a bit like, if, I shouldn't really relate it to Trump, but if he says something, you might wait for other presidents to say it as well, to, to be you know, meaningful with respect. Um, say with my prime minister, let's not go political, but, but um, any one study that has what we call significant difference, you can't use it as gospel. You've got to wait to see if the pattern holds. Um, and then if, if the pattern holds across lots of different boundary conditions, so different countries, different types of people, then you can go, right, there's, this is meaningful and there's something here. So sounds an early promising trigger, but it's hard for us to generalize. So we've just dropped the data from Germany, Austria and Switzerland. So we'll be looking hopefully into more sound in the next few weeks, actually. Um, so what I will say is just because someone pays attention doesn't mean they're going to choose it. So I kind of look at this relationship as being cousins, not siblings. So it's second generation, not first generation relationship. Now, again, as an attention advocate, that's probably not what you would expect me to say. You probably expect me to say, oh yes, attention will always drive a sale, but that's not what we see. Um, we see that there are attention spikes throughout, um, and I explained that in the early day, in the early slides, um, there, there are attention spikes triggered, but not all of this is directly translated to a sale. And let's just unpack why. 
Um, firstly, um, I'm hoping that you are familiar with Ehrenberg Bass' work or Andrew Ehrenberg specifically, um, that the concept of attention is not a persuasive force. Um, you know, a lot of the American literature talks about advertising is persuasive and it basically means that we can literally drop, stop you in your tracks and you go off and buy something. But the, the broader literature um, is very much around advertising is there to nudge your existing propensity. So that means that you were already in the market. It's likely you were already going to buy that particular brand. You might have chosen another one, but largely that's the one you choose. So it nudges propensities, but it's not going to stop you in your tracks. That's, that's generalizing. There are always exceptions to every rule. Okay. But this is why advertising, so this is why sales and, and attention are not perfectly linearly related because advertising is not persuasive. But the second thing is because most ads fail to link the ad to the brand at all, right? And this is a creative. So any of you who are moving into the creative field, take this with you, that if you have someone's attention and you don't lick the brand, then you will likely have that creative work harder for the competitor. Now, bearing in mind, Michael, the next video does not have sound, so nobody worry, but I wanted to show you this video. Um, clearly, it's an Australian ad, clearly. So I can't get your answers right now, so I'm just gonna talk through it, but normally I'd ask the audience, you know, this is a high arousal moment. So this is a moment in an ad we tested, which truly spiked, because koalas are cute, if I do say so myself. Um, but you can't tell me what brand it is, let alone what category it is. So I usually ask the audience, what category do you think it is? Most people said water. Most people say Evian. It's actually an insurance brand. So in Australia, it's a massive, massive brand. It'd be like Geico to you, right? So you, everyone knows who Geico are. So the fact that this is a really expensive piece of advertising and it's the most attentive spike is amazing. No one really knows even what category it is. So what we find is that the mere presence of branding at attention peaks just increases the chance of buying. It doesn't mean you will, but it still actually improves it. So this particular slide shows that propensity to buy is amplified when the brand is present at attention peaks. So that's good news and pretty easy for advertisers to fix. So, so don't just be building these beautiful ads and hoping that people understand what brand it is. Um, you know, make sure you become, you, you tell people what, what the ad is for. On a side note, we also see that brand size matters. So, um, Again, probably less important than having a brand there at all, but we see that things like the size of the ad, uh, sorry, the size of the brand matters relative to choice. And that is really, really important when you think about making mobile ads as well. So for example, the, the, the example above, which is Lipton in Australia, you know, if that was a mobile ad, you can barely see what that brand is for, but when the brand is in the foreground and it's in a mobile, space which is a much smaller absolute ad it's really important duration matters so try and keep the um brand on for as long as you can on the screen because again we switch in and out of attention so, so just because it's there for a fleeting second doesn't necessarily mean that you'll register that and early branding matters we talked about uh duration most platforms you'd be lucky to get a few seconds from particularly the high profile platforms um, that you know we don't want to name but you know you very rarely see an ad for more than a few seconds so it's really important that early branding matters as well and the reason why that is again I would normally ask you uh, audience to to go with me on this but I'm just going to talk you through it so because our brains are trained to satisfy so remember we talked about what satisficing means this means when the brand is missing we fill in the blanks. Normally I have the audience sing along with me when we talk about that, excuse me. <coughs> um, so what this means is again, the attention you work so hard for will be benefiting your larger competitor when we think about double jeopardy. So that's really important. So every time you make an ad, quality branding is the most underrated variable of all time. So to be really mindful of that. I'm gonna cough again, excuse me. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
So some good news um, for advertisers, by this time they're usually depressed. So for good news for advertisers is that there is some value in low attention. Um, and what this means is that we can actually see that even if you're not looking straight at the ad, there is an impact, right? That's good news because we are filtering in and out um, and we are sort of scanning our peripheral generally. Um, bearing in mind, if you're looking straight at the ad, there's the highest lift. So, so let's not, you know, joke side, but there is um, a really big impact if you're going from zero attention to passive, what we call passive attention or low attention. So that's good news. And, and so there's this concept of when we notice, when we, even when we think we're not noticing, we do. So I've got a video. So Michael, butt in if the sound doesn't work, hopefully it works now. But this is a little video and a little funny kind of explanation of priming. Oh my god. There's nothing you can really do about it because you don't even realise it's happening. It's just scary. Do you want to just leave that envelope there, by the way? Here's your menu. Give you a couple of minutes, all right? Do you for a calamari What are you thinking? Triple dip chicken. Triple dip. Triple, Triple dip. dip. Triple dips chicken, please. This envelope was given to you before you made your choice, right? Yeah. Are you being for real? Oh my God. That's just crazy. There was other things that I wanted on this menu. That's so weird. How did you do that? I just want to know how. I've seen that. Dr. Alex, the guy from Love Island. Yesterday, I saw this on my feed. I was thinking, he's a doctor, but he's eating greasy food. It's Anton. I saw that when I looked on his thing as well. Big smile afterwards, like, mm, that was delicious. Oh, wow. Scrolled right past, didn't even like it, but that is so weird. Hello. Triple dip chicken, you can't resist. Oh, wow. I didn't even notice that. That's crazy. <laughs> I didn't notice that on the seats, actually, I'm not going to lie to you. I remember, like, the colours more so than the actual thing on it. Oh, yeah. I didn't even notice. That was on the wall as well. I can't remember it. I don't remember that. Really, it's, like, subconsciously. You're playing the tricks of your mind. So it already does influence you then, doesn't it? I think this method of marketing... Uh, so she goes on to say that from a food from a junk food perspective, that's not great. But the point of the video from my perspective was that even when you notice, when you don't notice, you do notice. Um, but this is where distinctive assets are really even more important. So, so if you didn't think branding was important before, um, it's more important now because we focus out, right? So distinctive assets um, are another level than branding. So distinctive assets are things that you recognize without even noticing. So one of them said something about color. So a classic example is, you know, the yellow arches um, of McDonald's or the red or, the, you know, the logo that is KFC. So the Colonel Sanders kind of thing. Sometimes it's about distinctive ads. Sometimes it's about music. Um, so, so do do some more work around distinctive assets. There's a whole um, set of literature on that. Um, but when you're not even looking and you recognize even in the peripheral that that ad is for that brand, it's more likely that the relationship between attention and sales will become brothers than, than, than cousins. So bearing in mind, remember that attention and memory are not the same thing. So just because I happen to look up doesn't mean I recognize in my brain what that's for. So that's where distinctive assets comes really important. So it's, it's, it's a whole package of things. Um, one of the things that's really it's not on my um, research agenda at the moment. However, you have the world's greatest researcher in New York. Unfortunately, I was going to have coffee with him yesterday, but I can't. Um, so his name is Dr. Augustine Fu. Um, and he is, um, I guess, one of the most famous researchers around ad fraud. So do look him up. So he he um, has work on his LinkedIn file um, that he shares for free. Um, but he basically 
not basically, he says that the ad fraud problem is larger than you think. Um, so, you know, the WFA is the World Federation of Advertisers, and this is a couple of years old now. I happened to see the chair of the WFA only two weeks ago in Europe, and, um, you know, this number is outdated. So 88% of digital ad clicks are deemed fraudulent. Now, there are a number of ways. So let's not go straight to the platforms because the big platforms, like the premium platforms like Facebook, YouTube, they... Uh, um, they have a way of being able to push away a lot of the, the clickbait type fraud. Um, they still have issues with duplicate accounts and fake accounts, um, but in terms and fake subscribers, um, but in terms of clickbait um, and stacking and cookie stuffing, all that sort of stuff, they are a lot more across. So when you do work, walk into, um, if you are going to a marketing role and you work in the media space, um, you, you need to white label and blacklist a bunch of publishers that are sort of out on the digital ecosystem that, you know, more than 88% of the clicks um, or views are fraudulent. So this is where we go, you know, based on ad fraud, which is a bit scary, um, based on the fact um, that there's a viewability issue. Um, this is why we kind of say that, attention as a human measure of presence and I, I don't like using the word engagement but I will for the sake of generalizing but human presence and human engagement is important um, so when many are not human or not seen our trading currency is failing advertisers and that's the ecosystem that I'm operating in at the moment um, and and we are moving towards um, change fast so if anyone wants a career <laughs> get into this space quick um, because this is a, the measurement reform is coming um, and uh, you know the big players are sort of saying in the next few years everything will be different um, and quality CPMs so if you haven't worked with media before CPM is cost per thousand so that's how you would so you would get a cost from a publisher let's just say it's a newspaper so for every thousand people that see this is how much you pay and it's the same with so that's the the standard currency across all um, media uh, owners at the moment. So, so, so Facebook charge you a CPM, Google charge you a CPM, um, the Times, the New York Times charge you a CPM based on the space, uh, TV charge you a CPM. So that's what the currency has been. But the problem is the impression that sits below those thousand views is either fraudulent or have a viewing problem. And that's the problem. Right, so cost can't be an appropriate cross-platform measure. So, so people are moving towards uh, rendering um, human presence. So that's where my stuff comes in. Um, Audible is becoming a big QPM, uh, QCPM requirement, viewable and duration. So, so people are moving towards, you know, particularly the big advertisers. Let's go Mars, Unilever, PNG. You know, all, all the big ones that spend the most money, they they are saying to Facebook, we won't give you any money or, or even the agencies unless these boundaries are put around our impressions. So the advertisers are definitely in revolt. So in my last um, uh, piece, I just want to kind of, you can use this in your own work, but we see that attention is a layered construct. So reach is obvious. So you need to reach more people to nudge light buyers. That's a whole nother lecture in itself. Um, but let's assume we have reach, then attentive reach is a layered construct. So we talk about the need for them all together to be um, functional. So for example, if you only have ad visibility and attention trigger, but you don't have quality branding, you'll likely misattribute that add to your biggest competitor. If you only have ad visibility and quality branding, but you don't have any attention triggers, you'll get limited cut through. So you'll have limited, um, you know, people stopping and looking. If you only have quality branding and attention, but you don't have the ad visibility component, the ad will be hardly visible. And if there's no human, there's no point. So I, I talk about these four things are really important from a creative and media sort of cycle to work synergistically. So this is why we think attention helps um, because it, it reflects. So the word modal 
means so 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 attention is comparable across platform because it reflects modal differences. Modal differences mean that um, on one platform you hold it in horizontal view um, and you don't scroll, whereas another platform the mode is that it's in vertical view and you're scrolling fast, and so that's modal differences. Um, so fortunately, in my space, um, investment is starting to um, flow quickly. So there's even venture capital, you know, if anyone's an entrepreneur in that space, trust me, I'll put you on to the people that, that started the, the, um, the fund, um, but apart from agency. So, so we, are, we are in a change and, you know, I'm really, really proud to be a part of it. So for me, my last little slide is um, in an attention economy, not all reach is equal. So Michael, my next slide was me sort of putting it out to the group. Are you happy for me now to, to move on to that? Yeah, well, I think, Karen, we have probably about 10 minutes left before we said formally we'd finish. So perhaps we'll, uh, you, you just see what your last few questions, if that's okay with you, yeah? Sure, sure, sure. And, yeah. uh, and then we can leave fo folks with a thought. Um, I, I do want to, Karen, I know that uh, Australia pulled out of Olympics, or at least has suggested well, but uh, you deserve a personal goal for, uh, for, uh, for getting through uh, at 2 a.m. what was an extraordinary, uh, you know, very thought-provoking uh, and powerful presentation. So if I, if I forget to say that, uh, uh, Australia wins their first gold. So, um, well, now, it's four, yeah, it's 4 a.m. now, so I'm guessing I probably won't go back to bed. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I hope that's a that's a inspiration and a model for our students around the world. I think we're all going to in a very different uh, way, and we've got to figure that out. So um, I want to go back a little bit, a couple of questions during the presentation uh, around the the tools um, and the platforms you were using. And one of our students asked, uh, you know, while you mentioned Instagram and Facebook, uh, have you started to look at the TikTok? which are themselves sort of very attention deprived uh, platforms and one, you know, wonder if you had any thought about expanding there. Um, so I can't really tell you who we're about to build out. Um, I can tell you that we've done the majors. So we've done so far Twitter, Facebook, YouTube and Instagram and a lot of the publishers but in in careful consideration i will tell you that there's quite a few others that want to build out so basically how it works is um, a platform will approach us to be a part of this process or an agency will approach us and fund via their partners um, so how it works is if if the platform um, has a web interface, we can actually build. And, and so for the likes of some that have an app only, we're working with them directly. So, so I can't answer specifically about TikTok, um, but I will tell you that there are three platforms that we're engaging with at the moment that um, wanna, wanna be part of the process. So beyond the, the big four. Yeah, excellent. Um, in the point, uh, the presentation you were talking about various types of triggers um, and um, you know emphasis on the bottom up triggers noises and and, and and visual cues I guess the question is do you get a sense that they are perhaps already overused or if they get utilized too often do we somehow kind of habituate to them and then tune them out yeah, yeah? Yeah, I mean, the problem with emotions is they're not universal, right? So what makes you laugh, Mark, will probably make not me laugh because I'm not a very funny person. Um, so emotions are a tricky one. And to your point, we become sensitised, or sorry, desensitised, I should say, to, to things like gimmick. Um, so it's harder. Um, but at worst turn sound off and have a plain screen. So there are some creative things people can do. Um, but, you know, it's a hard job being creative. You know, look where I'm sitting. I'm not technically sitting there, but, you know, it's, you know, there's so much clutter behind me in Times Square. And, you know, it's, 
it's a tough world to be a creative. So, so I feel like we go through waves with the creative cycle. Um, and it's not that easy to build amazing creative. Um, I do understand that. Um, so not all pieces can be hero. They have to be some of its hygiene, which I steal from Google. They talk about hygiene and hero pieces. Um, so, so yeah, th there is desensitization. Um, but then, you know, there's a lot of clever people in the world. I'm not, I'm, I'm left brain, not right brain or the other way around. I forget which way it is. I'm not creative. I'm, I'm, um, more research based. Um, so I think the short answer is, yeah, it's a tough job. Great. Um, we, we were, yeah, had Kim Snow, who's creative director of Google, uh, with us a few weeks ago, uh, to talk to the students, amazing, powerful presentation. And, um, a lot of what she said would probably resonate with your work, but one of the things she said, which with me, and I'd love your, she, she said she didn't believe so we were in an age of attention deficit or, you know, people's attention span was any shorter. She said, the problem is that uh, we've got less patience. And, and I thought that was thing, an interesting it's observation. A, I wonder. I would argue that's the same thing. So if we've got less patience is because we're busier and our, so, so attention span, how, so people often um, talk about attention span being akin to a fish. You know, you, you go in a, you've got six seconds. And so that, so no one really understands what span means. But the reality is the literature shows that the more information that we are surrounded by, the less we pay attention. So what she's saying is exactly the same as what I've just said. She's just talking about it in a different construct. Um, but with respect, this is the kind of pushback you would get from a platform because um, the minute that you make a platform accountable for human presence and for, just for time spent viewing, it's hard for them. And I understand that. Um, so being and impatient. Some of, some of her argument, I think Karen was probably along the lines of distinctiveness, distinctive assets and the fact that consumers don't have time on to spend on poor advertising, you know, and, and, and perhaps advertising that picks up on some of the emotional and cognitive, you know, cues you were talking about. I, I, I think, I think that was the, um, aspect she was. Well, yeah so she's right so it sounds more like we're actually aligned um that um we don't pay time to advertising and to certainly not like we used to um so the key she's probably right that the same as what i've said that distinctive assets are vital because you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be able to turn the world around and have all of a sudden you pay significant attention to every ad that is on YouTube. So in that sense, her and I are aligned in the sense that she believes that when our attention spans not going shorter, I don't agree. Um, perhaps last question from the, the field and then I never draw a charge for all of our students before we, uh, we leave. Um, question, uh, you know, digging into the attention model a little bit and, and um, what, what do you think of the context, like in terms of, you know, the time of day, you know, the season or even, you know, uh, you know, put in a way, something about living through the virus, this global pandemic must have changed uh, or influenced the models. How, how would you on that? Two things. Firstly, when there's significant change, the data is not normal, right? So whatever we're going through right now, when we use shape back into our economy in however many months, I don't even want to think about it, um, we'll go back to where we were. So, so any data from this period, I would discard anyway, quite frankly. Um, but secondly, in terms of context, so let's take away let, but I guess you're meaning, you know, we're paying more attention to news, for example, on COVID specifically. So that is a contextual conversation. Um, I, I agree with you that there's not enough good research to 
to demonstrate that generalizable across multiple platforms. So bearing in mind, remember what I've done in the past is we've put the creative in so that we can tell, and in fairness, we can see, so, so creative makes a difference, right? So what we've done is we've, we've put the same Calvin Klein ad into Twitter, same into YouTube, same into TV, same into Instagram, so that we can hold that variable constant so that we can understand the impact of the platform. So the next phase for us is to deep dive into context, but it's harder to do. And so my educated hypothesis would be that context matters without a doubt. So from the perspective of the virus, we're a lot more alert around things that tell us what's next. Um, in terms of the data from an attention perspective right now, it's, it's not normal, but, um, but there's not a lot. So there's early research, but it's not generalizable. So, so, um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think context matters. A will Good matter. Start. I'm going to reappear if, as if by magic, hopefully. Um, let's see if I'm on here now. Um, uh, yep, I think I should be. Um, you guys, I, I, I do want to thank uh, Karen for joining us again. Uh, tremendously uh, uh, thought-provoking and engaging discussion. A really powerful work. We look uh, forward to having Karen in better times with us in person. And, um, you know, we're keen to work directly with her on a number of different initiatives. And I know some of our faculty who've been on the conversation as well are at the bit to bring some of this knowledge into the classroom as well. So I want to thank you for that. Um, you. We will make uh, the recording available, if I, assuming I figure that out technologically. And uh, can also uh, send some additional links, you know, some, some of the mentioned with some follow-up for people on the call. Um, so uh, I know you have some sort of parting question you want to encourage people to think about, perhaps they can bring back to class. Today marks the beginning of class or the resumption of class after the spring break. So uh, you, you can get them, you can get everybody uh, going. So over so to what you. I wanted So <laughs> what I wanted to say was, um, you know, I'd love you to think about what BS you think's in the media space. Um, now that could be anything from what they claim to do or, you know, what, you know, what's usually what they claim to do, but, um, try, try and think and think outside the digital world. Like, you know, there's a, there's a whole world of media outside of YouTube and, and Facebook. Um, so, so what would you, if you were, if you were in my position, what would your research agenda look like? What, what would you call out and what would you like to understand if it's real or not? And a classic example is what Michael just said, does context matter? Um, so, so, so have a think about that. All right. On that, again, I want to offer everyone on the call, friends of our students, our faculty and our staff, many of whom I know are around the world uh, and to Karen particularly, stay safe, stay healthy and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you in best. Many thanks indeed. Thanks guys. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.